last week on The Season. All right, we're out here, you know, giving back to the community, Operation Christmas Child. We just put together a few boxes as our token of appreciation, you know, in the Ole Miss community. It says, Merry Christmas from DeMarcus Lodge and the Ole Miss football team. We hope you have a great one. This is going to make somebody's day. And, you know, I, I feel, feel wonderful. Specially made by DeMarcus Lodge. Without scout team guys giving you great looks, you're going to struggle at actually understanding what the game plan is and performing it. This is going to hit home. I know it. Let's go. Go score. Go score. I'm about to have a house party on the scout team. Touchdowns. You get what you put in, and it's the whole team. So you can you can take the approach that I did, and that was I was going to make a statement. You know that I can play with anybody. And that's it. Vanderbilt down 10 to nothing in this game. Outscores Ole Miss the rest of the way. Final score: Vanderbilt 38, Ole Miss 17. Second and three. Ole Miss needs to get in a rhythm here. And Walton gets only a yard there, so it'll be third and about two as Chucky Hunter clogged up the middle. It's Robert Conyers being attended by the medical staff. Ole Miss cannot afford more damage to their offensive line. Two years ago during a Peach Bowl, you know, he kind of injured his, his other knee. You know, he had some some minor stuff during the season, but during the Peach Bowl, you know, we came back in town. He says, "Man, this thing's this thing's bothering me." You know, so we kind of looked into it further, um, and we scoped his knee. And then, unfortunately, in spring, you know, he got rolled up, injured the same knee again, just in a little different spot. So we had to scope him again. So that's you know, obviously two surgeries within about you know four months. And then you know, he worked hard to get back with that. You know, started the season was doing well. And then, uh, you know, in Memphis, he tears his ACL on his opposite knee. So basically, you know, less than a year, he's had two operations on one knee and one operation on the other. Let's check with the Richard got a Rebel down. That's Robert Conyers, too, who's yeah. been fighting that knee injury, Richard. He really has. And, you know, just banged up cumulatively probably over his career throughout this season. He's rolling around and really in some pain. Looks like they're looking at his left knee. You know, Rob's had, he's had more injuries than uh, you would wish on anyone in this game. And those are those are very disappointing moments when you've battled back and all of a sudden something happens again. He's had more than his share. Uh, this one happened in Memphis, and the other one I just kind of had a little bit lingering, uh, bruising issues and stuff. So it's getting better though. One of one of many. That's the, that's the biggest one so far. Little battle scars. You know, everyone has a finite number of games and practices they're involved in. So when, when that gets taken away multiple times, you know, a lot of people do get down. So he has had a tough road, but he does work hard. You know, he's another guy that in the weight room with Dom, that they've done a good job of putting a program together for him. Coach Dom, the weight coach, does a great job. I mean, every day it's something new. It's just, I mean, there's not a day goes by that I'm not sore from his workouts or same thing with Pat and L. I mean, they do a great job. Through hard work and dedication during his rehab, Conyers was able to work his way back into the starting rotation by the beginning of the 2016 season, picking up where he left off at the center of the line. Man, I, I could go on and on with individual efforts, but uh, I'd start with Robert Conyers, you know, the you're talking about a guy that gives everything to a program. He's three knee surgeries, hasn't practiced all week, does not need to really play tonight, and uh, and jumps out there and gives us his 20 to 30 snaps. You know, guys like that, the resiliency and fight paid off in a, in a 60 minute SEC road battle. Through the injuries and the rehab, Conyers was physically stronger. Emotionally, however, 
he had been carrying the memory of former teammate Park Stevens for the past four years. Park was a was a junior college transfer that came in, was there for the for the spring practice, you know, kind of like one of the freshman early enrollees. And um, him and you know him and Park hit it off. Robert and Park did. Who's this big goof? I mean, who's this big six foot nine, six foot eight, just goofball that's running around here and cracking jokes to everybody. He's one of those guys that you feel like you knew forever. Park and Robert had just an instantaneous relationship. They bonded immediately. Um, they have a lot the same personality, so many of the same mannerisms. I still see mannerisms in Robert, and I think, gosh, that's Park. They just, they hit it off in a way that um, it, it's hard to describe. They were so much alike, it was almost like uh, uh, their, their moms had them and put one up for the adoption and the other one, you know, wound up with the other family, you know. I was living in the dorm and he, used to, he had just gotten here from JUCO and he was just like, hey, you, you, you looking for somewhere to live? And I was like, sure, man. So we got this little two bedroom, two bathroom apartment over there at the Lynx and I mean, it was a lot of, a lot of man in one little house. You know, your roommate is the guy you go through it with. You know, when you have your problems or, you know, you're late and they're trying to wake you up and get you to a workout. But um, Robert probably took Park under his wing, you know, a guy coming in from junior college. Um, but they did have a, you know, a special relationship. And any any time that that happens with a roommate, um, it's tough. It was July um, 3rd, and we had taken, gone on the first family vacation without Park ever because he was back doing his thing at Ole Miss and he had workouts in class and all. We were celebrating Gail's birthday. Her birthday's July 1st. We'd waited till we got to the mountains with the grandkids to actually have the birthday party and the cake. I um, posted a picture of Dean in the hot tub with our grandbabies and the caption under it was, um, life is good. And five minutes later, um, Dean's brother called us. I thought something had happened to my mom. And uh, I thought maybe he just wanted, you know, it to be told by someone else to me. And uh, I kept saying, you know, is there something wrong with mama? You know, what, what's happened and all? He said, I just need to talk to Justin. And uh, I said, well, Ashley, I said, something's not right. I said, tell me what's, what's happened. And uh, he said, Dean, he didn't make it. I said, what do you mean he didn't make it? He said, Park didn't make it home. He said, he's gone. It was almost like instantly I heard Dean keep saying, Ashley, I don't understand you. You've got to talk to me. And I just had this feeling and I looked at him and he, I said, the baby's dead. The baby's gone. It's just like the, the world stopped. And you just go numb. You don't know what to say. But I can remember hanging up the phone and going straight upstairs to the bedroom and pulling out the suitcase and start throwing clothes in it because I had to get home. My first thought was somebody get to Robert. Um, I knew the relationship the two of them had, and I said, he's all alone. His parents are in Miami and we're in Catlin Park. Somebody get to Robert. And they told me, don't worry. Robert's surrounded by coaches and linemen, and he's okay. Park Coleman Stevens. At 6'8", 350, the gentle giant was known for his bear hugs, his huge heart, and captivating smile. A stranger to none, and a friend to all. I'm mean, thinking about him. Was, I mean, all the stuff that he's done for us, you know, taking care of his parents. Still in shock from the tragedy and compelled to do something more, Conyers went to Coach Luke with a special request. I remember that first day back walking into the meeting room and 
kind of looking around and I was like, there's gotta be something I can do. There's gotta be, there's gotta be more. Robert asked me if, you know, he could wear, you know, 75 and, um, and you know, I said, you know, you sure this is something that you want to do because, you know, that's, you know, that's a tough, tough thing to do is to, to, you know, carry on that memory. But it was something he wanted to do um, in, in honor of Park. And I know that Robert's heart is in the right place and he wanted to do it for the right reasons. We couldn't ask for a, a bigger um, request to be honored than the one that Robert gave us that day when, when he asked to change his number. And for him to want to honor Park in the way he, that he has and to keep his memory alive, uh, you can't ask more as a mom and a dad for him to have done what he's done. Robert wearing 75 um, has changed its meaning. The first game, when Robert ran onto the field, there was this feeling of us seeing Park run onto the field. It didn't take long after that till it wasn't Park, it was Robert. It was our other son. It was the person who promised that he'd take care of us and that he would love us and that Park's memory would live on in him. I mean, it puts, it puts it in perspective for him of all this is is an injury and I can bounce back from this. I mean, every time I get hurt or any time it's like a step back, I always think like, man, it could definitely be worse. You know what I mean? It could always be, you know what I mean? It could always be the other side of the coin. And like kind of just, you know what I mean? Puts like the cap on his, you know what I mean? On his playing career as well as mine. You know what I mean? I feel like it's, it's an honor just to be out there and know that there's somebody else that means a lot just because of the number I'm wearing on my, my jersey. As an 18 year old child, he had to face something most adults can't face. And he chose to face it by making a promise to two people that he had known less than a year, that he would love them and he would take care of them and he would always be there for them. And that 18 year old boy kept that promise. I believe this is Robert's way of carrying Park's memory. And I think when he puts that jersey on, he, he's representing more than a number. He's representing himself but he's also representing Park and Park's family. God's plans are not ours to see until they're laid out in front of us. But Park served his purpose in God's eyes. I think God had a little bit more work for Robert and it was to go out there in that number 75 and wear it with pride. When you look around our house, you see the 75 you will see it at the top of our Christmas tree. You'll see it uh, in pictures. And a lot of those pictures may not be a park, they may be Robert. But uh, when, when folks talk about that number, it's not just park, it's, it's, it's Robert Conyers that seen it. <laughs> so. When Rivalry Week rolls around, records and circumstances fade away. Despite a season full of heartbreak and near misses, the Grove was still bustling in anticipation for the 89th Egg Bowl. Ole Miss fans, both young and old, came in droves to watch their favorite Rebel make their last Walk of Champions. One last walk through the grove, a final stroll through extended family. And it was only fitting for the prize to be hoisted by the heart and soul of the Landshark defense. The season's culmination also brings with it senior night, 
and all the emotions that it encompasses. For a class of 27 seniors, today's game would be their final curtain call in front of a hometown crowd. I got to walk way down here senior night, trying to hold the tears back, but hey, I'm here. I am old Miss. I am old Miss. It's the best day of the year, but it's also the saddest day of the year. It's the mo most emotion-filled day of the college football season because it's goodbye to these seniors and these guys that you just named. Think where they've taken us the last few years. A lot of progress. Those wins over Alabama, those wins over LSU, those wins over State, and to the Sugar Bowl, thank you so much. Thank you is ina inadequate. We talked about last night. No matter how many speeches a senior gives, what is going to win this game? Uh, Execution, physicality, and effort. Third and ten for the Dogs from their own 36. Back to throw. Fitzgerald launches it near side, way overshoots his receiver who was open at the 35-yard line. It's fourth down, and Mississippi State will have to punt. This quarterback is a runner. You guys play great coverage, man. You see the high throws. He's going to throw high. He's nervous, right? Play your assignments, man. They can't do it. They can't do it. Patterson takes the snap, runs to his right, looking downfield, stops, now reverses to the near side, looking for a block. He's in trouble, splits two guys, and now runs straight ahead to the 20, 25, 30, the far sidelines, 35, 40, 45, slides down around midfield. Shay Patterson, Ed Living. off is the judge straight ahead he's the 10 he's to the five and he's got the first down for the rebels looks like a keen judd a wonder lick connects he's 21 of 22 on the year 12 of 12 from that range that was a chip shot pump face wants to throw over the middle got a man it's going to be caught at the 45 yard line of Ole miss first down for the bulldogs handoff to williams williams straight ahead the 10 to the five he's hit he's in the end zone touchdown State takes a six to three lead. I told you, you punish him with every run. You punish him with every run. Handoff straight up the gut, and Akeem Judd has come to play in Egg Bowl 2016. Pass toward the far side, one on one, grabbing the ball and stepping into the end zone. Here's Demaria Stringfellow. You look out to your right and you see him lined up with a cornerback and you just know, you know, if the ball goes his way, he's going to catch it. He's done it all year. He's done it since he's been here. He's a great player and, it's, you know, it's nothing new to him, nothing new to us. He just continues to make great plays. Good job, three. Good job, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Way to go hey. big body in. With this rivalry game in full swing, the Bulldogs would create space in the second quarter. Scoring on consecutive possessions, and capitalizing on a Rebel miscue. Fade route left side, and it's going to be intercepted by Mississippi State. It was intended for Adeboisio. Here's the snap as Gerald runs left, stops, throws in the end zone, man's wide open, touchdown. Wow, the Rebels bit and wide open was Malik Deary. Trailing by 17 points, the Rebels needed a spark, and it would have come in the form of punter, Will Gleason. Hunter's going to fake it and go, and Gleason's got the first down to 35. Go, Australian. First down, Ole Miss. Will Gleason playing a little rugby out there. That's how you make a play. There you go. Let's go. Crossing route. Stringfellow snags it. He goes right down the middle of the field. He's in the end zone. Touchdown to Mario Stringfellow. That was a rocket. Hey, let's be legendary right now. Let's get this going. There's a kick by Wonderlick, and he's got plenty of leg, and he drills it through. And it's 27-20 with 26 seconds to go until halftime. That's it, baby. Hey, one possession game in this day. One possession game. I believe every one of y'all, y'all. And I just want to have one game, bro. I want to have one game with all y'all boys playing y'all hard. Because I know what y'all about. I go in that locker room with some workout with y'all all year long. Five years. I know what y'all about. Let's finish, man. Second half. This is my last second half, bro. Let's finish. Though the Ole Miss defense would shine bright in the opening possession of the third quarter, the second half would belong to the Bulldogs. Defensively, they would bottle up the red and blue, proving that eventually every dog has his day.
Some things just don't go your way. Some things do go your way. It's just a part of football. You know, having the young team that we do, it's just you can tell in some people's faces that, you know, like, whoa, you know, this is really happening. You know, it's not supposed to happen like this. The disappointment that we felt, that the coaches felt, that the fans felt, that just shows you that everyone around here has an expectation of greatness, and we set that bar and we set that standard high. I'm just so proud that you know it started with my class. We're a great program. They made it relevant, so we have to do our job as underclassmen and everyone else left to just keep holding that name up high and just keep you know building on the legacy that they built for us. Nothing will ever change the fact that we spent time together, you seniors. But I don't want you for one second to forget the love that we had on this team. And you seniors, man, thank you for what you've done to, for this program. Thank you. you. You've changed it, and you've changed the expectations. And then you younger kids, remember this feeling. Just don't have it again. Seniors, we love you, man. Thank you. We've got a lot of work to do to, uh, to get back to where we want to be uh, starting in the off season and in spring ball for sure. And, uh, but it's a very disappointing night. Uh, it's tough on your families. It's tough on uh, you know, everybody around, uh, around the building. So you find out a lot about who you are and a lot about uh, who everyone is you know, that's with you. No matter how bad it gets, I feel like there's no excuse not to wake up and be ready to work, you know, be ready to go after another day. You know, it hurt this year stung and just to not ever want to feel like that again. We're going to do everything in our power when we get back and just work our tails off every day and just hold each other accountable. And I think that's the biggest lesson that we can take from it.